With a new coaching staff in town led by Mike McDonald, a trio of former second round picks will be looking to resurrect their careers starting in 2024. Who has the best chance for a big bounce back season with the new coaching staff? I'll be diving in our Thursday edition of Locked On Seahawks. You are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings 12, this is Corbin Smith, host of the Locked On Seahawks podcast, your daily Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. A special thanks to each and every one of the 12s tuning in on this wonderful Thursday, whether you're listening in in nearby Bend, Oregon, or across the country in Morgantown, West Virginia. Greatly appreciate each and every one of you for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. Now that free agency has slowed down to a slow crawl, going to finally be dishing out my free agency grades for the nine outside free agent signings the Seahawks have made to this point. Also going to be doing a bit of a roster reset pre-draft, looking at offensive position groups and ranking them from best to worst as we get closer to the three-day festivity coming up in Detroit. This episode is brought your way by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200. If your bet wins, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Now for your lead story here on our Thursday edition of Locked On Seahawks with Mike McDonald bringing in a brand new coaching staff. The only holdover from Pete Carroll's staff being Carl Scott, the defensive backs coach and defensive pass game coordinator this creates an opportunity for several of seattle's returning players to potentially take a big step forward and that's especially the case for a duo of players who were previously drafted in the second round that many expected weren't even going to be on the roster this next season most notably receiver d eskridge john schneider discussed this on the radio a few weeks ago and speaking with him at the NFL annual meetings this week, he made it clear that the coaching staff change has everything to do with the Eskridge still being on the roster. Mike McDonald, Ryan Grubb, the rest of the offensive staff, they are intrigued by Eskridge's athleticism and his overall talent. His biggest issue has been being on the field. He's had multiple injuries, and of course, last year he had the six-game suspension at the beginning of the season, so it's limited his ability to really get in a rhythm either on offense or special teams. He did have an explosive kick return to open the game against the 49ers last season in Seattle. Other than that, though, there's been very few highlights, and most of it's been lowlights for D. Eskridge. So a lot of people, including myself, anticipated he would not be back. And yet, this new coaching staff, they want a chance to see what they can do with him because there aren't very many players that run in the low four threes that have kick return ability after the catch ability the way that D. Eskridge can if he's healthy. There's obviously a huge if there. And then you've got Daryl Taylor, who production-wise, he does have over 20 career sacks. So he's been able to get after the quarterback. And yet at the same time, he's lost his starting job each of the past two seasons early in the year. His run defense has not improved at all, despite the coaches and the player himself saying they've prioritized that. He's not made those improvements. And so he's had limited opportunities. And really, he's been feast or famine as a pass rusher. There's a lot of sacks there, not a lot of quarterback hits, only eight of them last year for the entire season, a pressure rate below 6.5%. So those two players, they are going to get an opportunity on revised contracts. Eskridge restructured his deal so that it was a little smaller cap hit for the Seahawks. And Daryl Taylor's only got $20,000 guaranteed on his new one-year deal Rather than getting a tender, there are incentives that they are dangling out there for Taylor with sacks and quarterback hits. So he has an opportunity to make a little bit more money than he would have on an original round tender. But both of these players are coming into this season hoping to finally turn the corner with a new coaching staff. And a lot of times this doesn't end up happening. Usually players that have underachieved for three full seasons, the way that we've seen from Eskridge and to a lesser extent, Daryl Taylor A lot of times you don't see that huge leap with a new coaching staff, especially with a staff like Pete Carroll's that has done really well for the most part, developing young players for over a decade in the Pacific Northwest. But 
there's always unique circumstances. So looking at those two players in particular, let's start off with D. Eskridge in terms of his ability to potentially resurrect his career. And this truly would be a resurrection because he's only got 17 receptions for his entire career in three seasons with the Seahawks, 122 receiving yards. DK Metcalf has had several games. He has done that in one game. That has been D. Eskridge's production in three seasons with the Seahawks. And he had a touchdown as a rookie, has not scored ever since. He gave them a little bit more contributions as far as being a kick returner when he was healthy last year. But this really does feel like a case where the odds are stacked against D. Eskridge compared to even Daryl Taylor here for a couple of reasons. One, you look at the position group he is in. DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett's back. Jackson Smith and Jigba had a really strong finish to his rookie season. Sky high expectations for him. Jake Bobo had really good numbers as an undrafted rookie. Dariq Young is coming back. Where is D. Eskridge going to get the opportunity to even get the reps to truly impress this coaching staff during offseason workouts and training camp. Maybe he'll get some of those reps if Metcalf and Lockett are not out there, which they may miss some time and not be there because it's voluntary this offseason. But when it boils down to training camp and when everybody's got to be there, unless there's injuries, I don't know how D. Eskridge is going to even get into the lineup to be able to try to resurrect his career. The Seahawks will give him some looks. This coaching staff wants to see what he can do. I do think, however, that the kick return changes that have been made, that adds a lot of intrigue to special teams in general. Eskridge has flashed there. We saw some big returns last year in limited action. So that might be where he can truly contribute for this football team. I just don't know that there's going to be a place for him on offense. Maybe Ryan Grubb looks at him and thinks, you know what? There's a really good chance that we can find a way to sprinkle him in into the slot on the outside and mix him in the way that Washington used uh, Jalen McMillan and Jalen Polk, where he can get the ball and they can create some big plays after the catch. I just don't know where those snaps are going to come from on the offensive side of the football. I don't necessarily think I can say the th same thing, though, with Daryl Taylor right now. When you look at where things stand at the edge rusher group, Seattle has not made any additions there. That doesn't mean they won't draft somebody end of next month to further supplement that group. But Boy Mafe and Chetanuosu are going to be the starters. Derek Hall, I'll get to him here in a second. We didn't see much from him in his rookie season. Seahawks still find some ways to make this group more consistent. And Taylor, that's really been the biggest issue for him, the lack of consistency. He has flashed elite pass rushing skills, including six and a half sacks the last six games of the 2022 season. But then he'll disappear for several games. There's been some forced fumbles. Then he'll go a long stretch where there aren't any turnovers created. So it has really been feast or famine for him. But I get the sense from talking to Mike McDonald on Tuesday, John Schneider as well, that Seattle looks at Taylor as a player that they truly believe that with a new coaching staff that might be able to push the right buttons. The motivation is there. He's always wanted to prove himself, but he just hasn't been able to put it together in the field. He's had some injuries, obviously missed his entire first year recovering from a broken leg. It seems like there is a better opportunity there for Daryl Taylor, even in this scheme. Maybe he can be the Tyus Bowser of this defense like Baltimore had for several years where you are able to get really good pass rushing production. And maybe Mike McDonald and his staff, they can reach him and really help with the run defense. I don't think he's ever going to be a plus run defender, but if they could just get to the point where – he was average and it wasn't a complete hindrance to the team having won the field against the run, then I still think that Daryl Taylor can be a guy that can give you really good production. He's had limited snaps the last few years in part because he hasn't been able to hold on to a starting job. I don't think he's going to get the chance to start for this defense with who's in front of him, but you've got to have four or five guys that can rotate in off the edge. There's going to be an opportunity there if he doesn't take advantage of it in training camp. Seattle can easily move on from him with the limited guaranteed money in his contract. But this really is that last carrot they're dangling out there. Mike McDonald wants to see if his coaching staff can push those right buttons. So of those two players, I should think Daryl Taylor, it isn't just because he's been more productive in general. I just think that there's a better opportunity for him to increase his production, given the players on the depth chart on that edge rushing group. And real quick, I want to touch on Derek Hall. I didn't put him in this competition between Eskridge and Taylor because look, he's had one year of NFL experience, but there are already some fans out there 
looking at the lack of pass rushing production last year, no sacks, just five quarterback hits. There were some flashes defending the run from Derek Hall, but he really was a non-factor rushing the passer. There are a lot of Seahawks fans out there that are already looking at this pick from the second round a year ago and wondering, did we overreach our bounds picking Derek Hall in the 30s? But this guy's got all the physical tools. He's got a relentless motor. He's another one that I'm really excited to see what Mike McDonald and his staff could do. And he's only had one NFL season. We saw what Boy Mafe did going from year one to year two. I could see Derek Hall maybe not having that kind of a jump, but I could see him being far more productive, especially if the coaching staff is able to scheme him up a little better to create one-on-ones where he can get after the quarterback. So he maybe next year would be in a discussion like this, but this really is between Taylor and Eskridge. And right now I think Taylor's got the best opportunity, the best situation to be able to rejuvenate his career and really have a breakout fourth season for the Seattle Seahawks. Coming up next, I'm going to shift gears away from the players that have disappointed into looking at the depth chart on offense, pre-draft version, ranking Seattle's six positional groups. I'll get to that here in a moment on our Thursday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This episode is brought your way by FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney with March Madness officially underway. Whether you're betting on a double-digit seed like North Carolina State or top-seeded Houston in the Sweet 16, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines, you can even pick who's going to win it all. Whether you think it's going to be a blue blood like North Carolina or a Cinderella such as six seed Clemson, all options are on the table at your fingertips. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. You're listening to the Thursday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This is your host, Corbin Smith. A special thanks to all the 12s listening in. And as always, thanks for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. If you're sick and tired of Fox Sports and ESPN with all the shouting and you have to constantly turn down the volume, make the switch to Locked On Sports today. A free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today. Brings you can't miss analysis, opinions and news, streaming 24 7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are now less than a month away from the NFL draft. As we say on here in January and February, it's going to be here before you know it. Blink a few more times and we will be doing the three day festivities in Detroit. Keeping that in mind, with free agency, the Seahawks have not made any moves for several days. Maybe they'll make one or two more signings before the draft gets here in late April. But free agency is basically over, at least the first couple stages. And I would not anticipate you're going to see much activity until after the draft happens. So with that being said, I'm going to look at Seattle's depth chart. And we're going to be doing some positional rankings on the offensive side of the football. Where do things stand from the offensive line to the tight ends, to the running backs, to the receivers, to the quarterbacks? So let's get to it again. This is a pre-draft ranking. This could look different, and we're going to have a chance to look at these again after the draft. But this is where things stand for the Seahawks right now, and this is my opinion. I'll have some analysis for you. But for me, kicking things off here, it's got to still be the receiver group. And I hit on this talking about D. Eskridge in the first segment, that Eskridge has talent. There's never been any denying that, but he's not been able to put it together on the field because of injuries and suspensions. He has spent more time sidelined than actually playing, and now he's got to deal with a receiving group that's got DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, a rising potential star in Jackson Smith and Jigba, Jake Bobo, who I have heard Brian Grubb is very high on, Dariq Young, who's got great special teams ability, could still be somebody that contributes on offense as well. This is one of the deepest receiving cores in the NFL, and that's one of the things that lured Ryan Grubb to take this job. He just had three great receivers at Washington. He is certainly going to be excited for the opportunity to work with these players, and I talked about it yesterday, that I believe Jackson Smith and Jigba might be the biggest lure there of those three just because of the success that Ryan Grubb has had with some of the receivers at Washington where they've attacked the middle of the field. I can see Jackson Smith and Jigba being somebody that really has a breakout second season 
playing in his offense where his strengths are going to be further accentuated than maybe we saw with Shane Waldron. And coming in at number two, this will surprise some people. I was thinking about quarterback at number two, but I just think you look at what Seattle's invested in the running back position. Ken Walker the third is somebody that could be a thousand yard rusher for the next two or three years. He's already done it once, almost got there last year. Zach Charbonnet might actually be a better scheme fit for what Ryan Grubb wants to do offensively, getting downhill. You saw what Dylan Johnson did for the Huskies last year. Charbonnet has a closer skill set to Dylan Johnson than what Ken Walker the third does. So a lot of it's going to boil down to the blocking scheme. But those two players, that should be one of the better young one-two punches in the backfield in the NFL. And I still have a lot of excitement about Kenny McIntosh. Didn't get any offensive snaps last year. Missed the first half of the season recovering from a knee injury. But no DJ Dallas anymore going to the Cardinals. McIntosh is going to get that first crack to be the third down back. And I still think there's some exciting things that he can offer this running back group. Those three players on their own, I expect Seattle's going to add somebody either late in the draft or in the undrafted ranks to this group. But I still think that this is a very solid running back group compared to the rest of the league. I would make an argument if they're used effectively and the line is able to open up some holes that this can be a top five running back group. Coming in next for me in my offensive pre-draft rankings, I'm going to have quarterback at number three. And I considered it at the second spot because Geno Smith's been a pro bowler each of the last two seasons. And Sam Howell, we've discussed ever since the trade of the commanders, the upside that he presents and some of the positives that he showed last year away from the interceptions, throwing for almost 4,000 yards. He's 23 years old, has athleticism, can run the football. I would make the argument that he is an upgrade over Drew Locke, at least from a long-term perspective. I think there's more upside as a starter from Sam Howell. So I think this group is better than it was, but you still got some of the long-term questions. How long is Geno Smith going to be your starter? Is this going to be his last season that he's the starter? Is Sam Howell somebody that has that ceiling where he can be the next franchise quarterback, or does he end up being a guy they traded for and he's a backup for a couple of years and then like Drew Locke, he leaves for another team in a couple of seasons? We don't know how all that's going to play out. So I can't put it higher than third just because there is some long-term uncertainty. But I do think the Seahawks have a better quarterback situation than a lot of people will give them credit for, especially outside of Seattle. I still think Geno Smith is a very rock-solid starter. And I'm a believer in Sam Howell's ability if they can develop him and they can put him in a position where he doesn't have to shoulder the entire load the way that he was trying to do in Washington last season. Coming in at number four on my rankings I'm actually going to have an offensive line group at number four, and this is assuming Abraham Lucas is healthy. I'm feeling a lot better about this now than I did three or four weeks ago with some of the murky developments that were out there. Hearing from John Schneider and Mike McDonald sounds like he has made really good progress coming back from that knee surgery, and ultimately they're hoping he's going to be ready to go for the start of their offseason program. He's going to be good to go in training camp. If Abraham Lucas is healthy, I still think he's one of the best young right tackles in the league, and I'm fascinated to see what Scott Huff and Ryan Grubb with his offensive line background can do with both both Lucas and Charles Cross, who is an immense talent. He's still only 24 years old, had his own injury issues early last year that I think impacted his play throughout the season, but I still think there's top five potential there, and potential is a dangerous word, but I think Charles Cross can still be a really good left tackle. I want to see what this new coaching staff can do with him. So you have those two players. You bring in a reliable veteran like George Fant that can be that swing guy. I thought Stone Forsythe had some positive moments last year. So I think the tackle group, the Seahawks are actually in decent shape if Charles Cross and Abraham Lucas stay healthy and they can take a big step with this new coaching staff developing them. And coming in the rear, my last two spots – in the offensive position group rankings, I'm sticking with number five being tight end. And I think this is a position that could be higher on this list if Seattle is able to take advantage of a draft class that I don't think has many blue chippers. Obviously, Brock Bowers is the one exception to that, but I think there's a lot of depth of the tight end position. I anticipate Seattle is going to use one of their selections next month on a tight end, and we'll see who they end up bringing in to go with Noah Fant and Farrell Brown. But there's not as much depth as we've seen. There's not as much experience as we've seen in this position group. So it's a little harder for me to have them higher on this list. I want to see how things play out with this offense. I think there's potential for Noah Fant to have much better receiving production in Ryan Grubb's scheme than what he had in Shane Waldron's. 
Farrell Brown has had his moments as a big play threat in the few opportunities he's had catching the football. He is a really good run blocking tight end. So this could still be a good group. I just think there's question marks, and I think they need to add depth. They need to add another young talent to this group, especially with Brown being on a one-year deal and being past 30 years old. There's some long-term questions there. And easily holding up the rail right now, we've talked about it ad nauseum this offseason, the guard and center positions. If Olu Oluwatimi becomes a player that I believe he can be, and I think he's going to win the starting job over recently signed Nick Harris, I think Ola Timby being a top 10 center is not out of the question. And that would be a huge development for a team that's had a new starting center each of the last five years. And it's been a rotating wheel of chairs. They just have not been able to get him or get a, a player at that position that's been a long-term answer, really. And Justin Britt was a solid starter, but really since Max Unger, they have not had a guy that has come in and been a top 10 caliber center. If Oluwa Timmy can do that, that improves the outlook for this group. But right now, your starters at the guard position are Anthony Bradford, who had an up-and-down rookie season. Who knows what his potential as a long-term starter is? And Tremaine Ankrum at the other position with 101 career snaps to his name and one start in four years with the Rams. So he hasn't played very much NFL football. In fact, he has one-sixth the number of snaps that Bradford had in his rookie season a year ago. This is a very inexperienced group from both the guard spots and to center, at least from NFL snaps. And so it is clearly the biggest question mark going into the draft. They have got to hit on at least a couple of picks to address that interior offensive line, assuming they don't add any more veterans to further supplement this group. Coming up next, I just threw out a bunch of free agent signings names. It's time to dish out my grades. Now that we're past those first few stages of free agency, how did the Seahawks fare with their outside signings players such as Farrell Brown and Rayshon Jenkins. I'll have those grades coming up next year on our Thursday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This episode is brought your way by Game Time. You shouldn't have to worry when you buy your next ticket to your next big event. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. They've got killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, Views from your seat and with their best price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. If you want to see the next couple rounds of the NCAA tournament, thanks to Game Time's awesome flash deals feature and a detailed stadium map, you can get excellent seats. For the Sweet 16 and the Elite 8 for under $250, and it's super easy. Forget planning months in advance. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event, and the Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find the same section, Elsewhere, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code L O C K E D O N for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. You're listening to the Thursday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This is your host, Corbin Smith. A special thanks to all the 12s that are tuning in. And thanks for making Locked On Seahawks your first lesson five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. The Seahawks have added nine outside free agents since the start of the league year on March 13th. Most of those players being defensive players, though there have been a few uh, supplementary offensive additions from a depth perspective, perspective for the Seahawks. Nine outside free agents, and since the Seahawks appear to be done or close to done signing free agents at this stage, and they are fully moving forward towards the draft, it's time to dish out my post-free agency grades. We're going to start on the offensive side of the football, and I mentioned the tight end group. I had tight end ranked fifth out of six position groups for the Seahawks right now on offense, and mainly it's because of depth concerns, but... I do like the addition of Farrell Brown at the price point the Seahawks brought him in at. $3.2 million up to $3.9 with incentives. This is a former Oregon standout, so he's got Pacific Northwest background. He was a top 10 blocking tight end in the NFL last year, according to Pro Football Focus. You turn on the tape and you can see why he was graded that favorably. He's physical. He's nasty in the trenches. He plays with an old school demeanor as an inline tight end. And by mid-November, he was still averaging over 20 yards per reception. Doesn't catch a lot of passes, but he does have the ability to win down the seam and create after the catch. So I think from a depth perspective, as somebody that has started 
quite a few games now in the NFL with several teams. He's an experienced player. I think this is a guy that fits their system really well. And Ryan Grubb will move him around some, might be able to play out of the backfield. So I'm going to give that one a rock solid B for the value and the fact that this guy should be a pretty good replacement for Will Disley that can do a lot of the things in the blocking game and may have more upside in the passing game in this scheme. Shifting to the offensive line, that's where the next three signings are. Let's start with a local kid here, Nick Harris. One year, $2.51 million. If there was more money on the table here, I would have a significantly lower grade because I don't know what the ceiling looks like for Nick Harris at this point. He's now had four years in the league. He's played fairly well when the Browns have started him, but there's been injuries in there. I look at the fact, though, that he's reuniting with Scott Huff, who was his offensive line coach at Washington. That's certainly going to be a feather in his cap as he competes against Olu Olu with Timmy for the starting job at the center position. He's also played over 150 snaps at right guard so far in his NFL career. So maybe he throws his helmet into the ring with the lack of depth that they have at that position. I like the positional versatility. I like the fit getting back with Scott Huff. So from a depth perspective, I like giving this money to him rather than overspending to bring back Evan Brown, who was the starter last year. So I actually am giving this one a B plus. I like it. If he ends up beating out Olu with Timmy, then this will look like an A, but certainly it gives him good young competition that's got a background with a coach should be able to enter this scheme seamlessly. So I really like that depth signing at the center position. The same can be said for George Fant at the right tackle and left tackle spot. He started games at both positions. A little bit more pricey maybe than I would have gone up to $14 million depending on playing time. But some of that was because of the lingering concerns with Abraham Lucas. That looks like it's maybe not as big of a deal now with the latest that we've heard from Mike McDonald and John Schneider. But still, you're bringing in a guy that knows Seattle well. He started his career with the Seahawks. He has started a bunch of games at both positions. Still a really good athlete for the tackle spot. And they need any of the experience that they can find right now. The senior member of that offensive line in terms of starts and playing snaps is Charles Cross. And he's going into his third year. So having someone like this that took such a unique path being a college basketball player to then moving to the offensive line and making it in the NFL and being a starter for a number of years, this is a really good asset for those two young tackles and the entire rest of the line. So I'm going to give that one another rock solid B. Not a fantastic player by any means. If he has to start a bunch of games, then certainly that's not what the Seahawks are hoping for, but it gives them a great veteran insurance option that's younger, obviously, than what Jason Peters was last year. The one O-line move that I have some questions about is Tremaine Ankrum, and it isn't because of value. $1.115 million, this is a veteran minimum deal for Ankrum. My biggest question is where he fits in right now with the lack of talent and depth on the offensive line. If they played this weekend, Tremaine Ankrum would be starting at one of the guard spots, probably the left guard position, and he's got 101 snaps under his belt in the NFL. I liked him coming out of Clemson. He played for two national championship teams. He played a ton of snaps at right tackle. He played some at left tackle. He had some guard experience in college. Not a ton, but a little bit. He has been all guard, really, since coming into the NFL. He's young. He's 26 years old. So there are some reasons for optimism if he can stay healthy. That has been the biggest issue. But I'm giving this one a C just because of some of the players the Seahawks could have made a run at at the guard position of free agency and opted not to spend the money to do so. They went really cheap. That has backfired a lot of times in the Seahawks in the offensive line. But this is a younger player that did play at a high level in the ACC Showed some good tape last year in a few games he played in on the offensive line for the Rams. Maybe there's something there. We just don't know. So I can't give anything more than a solid C on that one. Shifting over to the defensive side of the football, let's start in the secondary. Rayshon Jenkins, he is probably my favorite addition that the Seahawks have made in their back seven. Their linebackers and safety positions. Two years, $12 million. This is a very similar deal to what Julian Love got last year coming from the Giants and Love ended up making the Pro Bowl, had a really solid first year in Seattle. Quite frankly, I think Rayshon Jenkins is coming to Seattle with more accolades and more production to his name than what Julian Love had. He's an older player, 30 years old, but rock solid in the secondary for the Jaguars, over 1,900 career snaps at both safety positions. This guy's played in the hole. He's been a single high safety. He has played down in the box. He has blitzed. 
maybe not necessarily elite at any one of those things, but he's really good at a number of different things, a really solid all around safety. And those are the kind of players they were looking for. They wanted versatile defenders that had some experience at a number of different positions, athletic, can tackle, can make plays and coverage. Rayshon Jenkins can end up being a really good value on this two year, $12 million deal, teaming him up with Julian Love and another free agent I'll talk about here in a moment in Kayvon Wallace. So I'm going to give that signing a B. Plus. I love it. I think it's a really good one. Going to the linebacker position, Tyrod Do- uh, Tyrell Dodson, one year, $4.2 million. There's an experience question mark for me here. There's 15 career starts under his belt, 10 of those being last year. Watching the film, there were certainly a lot of things to like. One thing that concerns me a little bit is the fact that the Bills took him off the field, as we found out from Joe Marino of Locked on Bills and looking at the film as well to back that up. He was taken off the field on third downs and obvious passing situations for a safety, and that shows the Bills were not necessarily confident in him handling all those coverage responsibilities. The Seahawks don't be, don't seem to be concerned about that. He's 25 years old, so he's still a very young player. He is a thumper. He gets downhill. He hits people. I think there's a lot of upside here, and for that reason, I'm going to go with a B. I think he's a good skill set fit for what Mike McDonald wants to do at linebacker. I can't go higher than that, though, because I do have some questions about experience and where he fits as an every-down linebacker at this stage of his career. I actually like the other linebacker signing just a little bit better, even though Jerome Baker is going to be making almost twice as much money for the 2024 season. He is a six-year proven starter. He has done a number of things at a high level in his NFL career. He's got 22 and a half sacks. So Mike McDonald talked about this on Tuesday, how much he values blitzing. Everybody in his defense has to be able to blitz. Jerome Baker is one of the best blitzing inside linebackers in the entire NFL. He's been very productive when he's had his opportunities throughout his NFL career. He's had a lot of sacks, a lot of quarterback hits. He's also a very sound coverage defender. This is not a linebacker that was pulled off the field in exchange for another safety. He had the confidence of multiple defensive coordinators, wasn't asked to do as much in terms of complexity last year playing for Vic Fangio, but this is a guy that's had really good success intercepting passes, getting his hands on passes for breakups. Run defense, he's been solid. He can't get eaten up by blocks. He's not as physical, not as big of a guy but I like the leadership, the fact he's played in a lot of games. He's athletic. He can cover. He can blitz. There's a lot to like about Jerome Baker. So of the two linebacker signings, that's the higher graded one for me at this stage. Now, going back to the safety position, Kayvon Wallace played with two teams last year, actually three because the Eagles had him in training camp. He was cut. Then he goes to the Cardinals. Eventually he's cut. Finishes the year with the Tennessee Titans. You would think a guy that's bounced around that much that you'd be thinking that's not a great addition. But I love this in terms of the value that the Seahawks are getting, just $1.125 million for one year. This is a guy that's been a productive tackler. He's got ball skills. Last year, he had over 15% of his targets turned into either pass breakups or interceptions. So there's certainly ball skills there. He's got plus athleticism. He has played both the safety spots. Again, that's something Mike McDonald and John Schneider now are valuing in this scheme. They want to get guys that are interchangeable at those safety spots. He's also played some nickel, so he gives you a lot of flexibility to play those three safety sets that McDonald played quite a bit with the Ravens when he was the defensive coordinator. I just look at the contract being a cheap veteran minimum level deal and the type of versatility, the youth. He's only 26. There's a lot of things to like about this signing, and I felt like it was odd, given how productive he was last year, that he couldn't stick on a team last season. I like this move from a depth perspective for the Seahawks. And my highest graded signing is going to go to the trenches, Jonathan Hankins. There's a number of reasons why this is my highest graded signing from this group. I love the fact that Jonathan Hankins finally gives Seattle a two or 340 plus pound nose tackle. They didn't have that traditional DT last year that could stuff the middle. He had three sacks playing for Adam Durde, a career high last year. Durde is now the defensive coordinator. There's that natural fit. John Schneider told me this on Tuesday that Adam Durde the entire time was basically begging, we got to sign this guy. He's a great fit, a great teammate. And so they got it done. And the fact they got him on a $1.24 million deal, an experienced nose tackle that has played for Adam Durde, he's going to know what to expect. 
can provide some leadership for some of the young players on that defensive line. This one, to me, from a value scheme and familiarity standpoint, it stands above the rest, at least in the short term. So Hankins, I'm giving that signing an A-. minus. It is my favorite from a grade standpoint, and I just love the fact the Seahawks are going to have a true nose that can plug up the middle, can make some plays on his own, like what Michael Pierce did for the Ravens last year. Maybe not the caliber of player Michael Pierce is, but not far off. He's still a very rock-solid NFL nose tackle. I think that is a big addition figuratively and literally for the Seahawks defense going into the first season under Mike McDonald. As always, you can follow me on threads and X at Corbett Smith NFL. Make sure to follow Locked On Seahawks on YouTube or wherever you're listening to your podcast to make sure you don't miss a single episode. When we return tomorrow, Blue Friday, I'll be joined by my co-host Nick Lee, and we're going to be taking a look at where Michael Penix Jr. may potentially still fit into Seattle's plans coming out of an impressive pro day workout at the University of Washington. You won't want to miss it. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday, and thanks for listening. Go Hawks.